So today I want to talk about the intersection of age and power in U.S. women's rights arguments from 1870 to 1920. I'm going to draw on archival sources that are in the Schlesinger Library here at Radcliffe, especially those that look at the anti-slavery and women's rights activists Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Tubman. And then after my talk, we're going to go over and we're going to see some of this stuff in person. So that's really the highlight here. OK, first I need to explain what I mean by the intersection of age and power in American history. There are many ways to look at issues related to aging. So here at the Radcliffe Institute this year, we have scientists that are looking at the degeneration of human cells or how childhood trauma impacts health in later life. We have poets and filmmakers and sociologists that are exploring the ways in which memories get passed down within generations in families. And we have people looking at how individual longevity depends upon the sustainability of our environment. We also have, and I am so lucky to say, uh, Robin Bernstein, Tanisha Ford, and Evie Shockley, whose work on youth and childhood and race has so deeply influenced my own. And I'm just thrilled to be in conversation with all these people. But that's not what I'm going to talk to you about, <laughs> OK? I'm going to talk about old age and middle age as political categories in US history. So Margaret Gallette, who's also here today, has shown that whatever happens in our bodies, we are, in her words, aged by culture. And she's asked us to think in particular about middle and old age as key periods where this happens in ways that are culturally defined but highly variable and contingent. Now, this headline proclaims Harriet Tubman, the oldest ex-slave. She's not at all. <laughs> but the fact that people thought she was and held a reception for her as such is politically and culturally significant. And these are the things that I want to draw your attention to. So this souvenir from Anthony's 80th birthday celebration juxtaposes two dated portraits of her. One, a family daguerreotype taken when she was a 36-year-old, relatively marginalized reformer. And the second, an official portrait for her 80th birthday when she had become the leader of a national movement and arguably one of the most famous women in the world. The souvenir draws attention to both precise birthdays, 36, 80, and the long stage of life in between, the middle years. And these are two ways, age and stage, in which we are aged by culture. Now, can any of you tell me why suffragists might have begun with a portrait at age 36 just after her 35th birthday? President. President. <laughs> yes. OK, so according to the Constitution, you have to be at least 35 years old to run for president, right? In practice, Americans have chosen men much older than that. In 1900, a man under 45 had never held the office. Now, if I were you, I would start Googling this, so I just did it for you. Um, the youngest man to ever hold the office was Roosevelt. He was not elected. He was elevated after McKinley's assassination. Kennedy is, in fact, the youngest at 43. Trump is our oldest ever at 70. Reagan was 69. Clinton, if she'd been elected, would have been 69. And Sanders, 75. The point I want to make here is that our young presidents, they're not really that young. Like, in what other context do we talk about young people of 45, right? And our old presidents aren't really that old. It's really an office for middle-aged men. And this was a problem for women. Because in the 19th century, single women reported that they became old maids at 30. And married women often wrote about feeling pushed to the background of their family circles by age 45. So how was a woman to become president, or senator, or even city councilor? In drawing attention to Anthony's life after age 35, suffragists challenged Americans to imagine her not just as the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, but I think as a credible candidate for the presidency of the United States. So the historian Alison Lang points out 
that this profile pose was new for women in the 1880s, and that suffragists turned to that to model their leaders after Roman statesmen. So this souvenir is, is drawing on that visual convention to imagine a very particular passage through Middle Age, right? So Anthony leaves the ornate but rather confined frame of a family portrait and grows not just in age but in stature. She looks back at her former self, but not with longing for lost youth, with pride in her accomplishments over time. As these two birthday programs suggest, suffragists modeled Anthony's celebration on those for George Washington. They used the birthday to insert a founding mother into a national narrative built around founding fathers, and to suggest that even at a time when most women could not vote for president, there was at least one woman in the nation that was qualified to be president. By 1900, Anthony had become not just an old woman, but a grand old woman. And she was not the only one. The archives of women's suffrage are filled with efforts to elevate mature women as national leaders. Suffragists built organizations that put middle-aged women in executive power and gave them a public voice. They theorized the significance of age in their writings and speeches. And they circulated images of older women and described these women as beautiful and charismatic. Now, suffrage is just one angle on age and power in American history. And what I'm hoping with this work is that it encourages you to think about others. And I'm very curious in the questions where you're thinking of age popping up. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to focus very narrowly on public celebrations for Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Tubman, using both as case studies that I think show why suffragists focused on these connections between age and power, and also how they disagreed with each other about what women's leadership should be and to what ends it should be used. So I want to start right after the Civil War. Uh, when supporters of Anthony and Tubman worked to sustain them in middle life and compared both of them to army generals. So Tubman was already famous as the Moses of her race for leading enslaved people to freedom. During the Civil War, she worked as a spy and helped pilot ships on the Combahee River where Union troops destroyed Confederate supplies and liberated more than 800 enslaved people. Many Union soldiers referred to her as General Tubman. Yet, because she had not formally enlisted, the US government did not pay her a salary, nor did she receive a pension for her disabilities. The government did pay pensions to both white and black Union soldiers who had been injured in the line of duty. But Tubman's injuries had occurred before the war, when she was an enslaved child, and right after, when she was coming home on a train and a white conductor violently threw her from the railroad car. These were not arenas that the US government recognized as battlefields. Tubman's allies, black and white, were outraged that she returned to her home in Auburn, New York, with no official recognition. They took up a subscription to fund a biography and organized a public fair at which the book and other items could be sold for her benefit. Now, these were tried and true ways for supporting formerly enslaved people. But what I think is new here is the way that supporters are comparing Tubman to a male military commander, to a general. So for instance, one supporter wrote to the local paper, Captains, colonels, brigadier generals have been created during our late war who never accomplished the shadow of the service to the country which this noble woman has performed. Now, many male veterans were entering politics. Comparing Tubman to these men suggested that she, though female, illiterate, and a manual laborer, was not only a citizen and a veteran, but a potential political leader. Middle age, and indeed chronological age, had a particular resonance for Tubman and her family. Because as she explained to Bradford, her biographer, 
Her mother had a legal claim to be freed at age 45, along with her children, a directive in her master's will that his heirs concealed from Tubman's family. Tubman liberated herself and then her mother. Now, this kind of age fraud was quite common. Under both private wills and gradual emancipation laws, many black families had to sue for the freedom that should have been theirs on the basis of chronological age. Other fugitive slaves protested that enslavers freed old people when they could no longer work and that this wasn't benevolence but a form of abuse or neglect. And, and as was true of many enslaved people, both Tubman and her mother had been denied access to any documentation of their birth dates. So Tubman's biographer reported that, quote, she was born as near as she can remember in 1820 or 1821. Harriet Tubman grows famously old, but she never knows her age. And she never has a birthday that she can celebrate. In contrast, white women suffragists emphasized their birthdays. So the first public birthday for a middle-aged woman in the United States was Susan B. Anthony's 50th in 1870, or so she claimed, and I haven't proven otherwise. So I want to make a crowdsourcing plea that for anybody who comes across mention of a public birthday for a woman in 19th century America, please let me know, because I'm trying to put together this comprehensive list. I'm a little obsessed, actually. Um, so for Anthony's birthday, the New York world claimed in the hyperbolic style of the day. Miss Anthony is again the Moses of her sex. She has perpetrated a daring innovation in regard to that subject which has been with woman the most sacred and inviolate. No more talk of women of a certain or uncertain age. Susan squarely owns up to 50. Papers as far away as San Francisco and the Hawaiian Islands noted that Anthony was particularly transgressive to announce her age because she was unmarried. For years, journalists and critics had been dismissing women's rights activists as sour old maids who couldn't get husbands. But in this moment, Anthony and her supporters reclaimed and redefined the term. She was, the New York Sun declared, a brave old maid. Matilda Jocelyn Gage explained the significance of Anthony's 50th birthday this way. Heretofore, to tell one's age has been looked upon as the death note for a woman. Her value has been only in her youth and good looks. Her intellect and soul have been passed aside. And no terms of reproach have equaled that of old woman, old maid. And I just want to pause on this and emphasize how often I'm seeing in the archives that this generation of women suffragists argued that white men maintained power in part by sexualizing young girls and then ignoring or denigrating older women. And I just think it's worth pausing on this idea right now in this context. <laughs> um, OK, this was also all about money. So the idea for the party seems to have originated as a fundraiser. Many guests brought a dollar for each year of Anthony's life and other gifts such as this gold brooch. Anthony desperately needed the money. The paper she published, The Revolution, was deeply in debt. In the late 1860s, she had alienated her former anti-slavery and Republican Party allies when she decided to oppose black men's suffrage until women could be enfranchised as well. Rather than reforging ties with black leaders, Anthony decided that she should appeal to prominent white people who had money and had connections. The birthday perfectly suited these aims as it functioned to mute criticism, raise money, and generate positive publicity. So to be clear, the event did not cause the racial and class divisions in the women's suffrage movement. What it did was justify, even celebrate, Anthony's controversial decisions as a form of brave leadership. So the poet Phoebe Carey wrote an ode for the occasion. We touch our caps and place tonight the victor's wreath upon her, the woman who outranks us all in courage and in honor. 
this is really more aspirational than true in 1870, right? There are arguably other women who outrank Anthony at this moment, not least, as I'll talk about, Harriet Tubman. So notice how Anthony, her supporters, and the hyperbolic journalists all took up titles widely used to describe Tubman, Moses, General, while failing to mention Tubman herself. Anthony certainly knew of Tubman, as they had many friends in common, and people who congratulated Anthony on her birthday also helped organize Tubman's fair. These connections are very direct. Uh, further, Frances Harper, another leading black suffragist, had directly told Anthony and her colleagues to focus on the needs of Moses and other black women. Instead, the birthday promoted Anthony's lone status as a woman general. So what we have here by 1870 in Tubman's Fair and Anthony's birthday are two efforts to elevate and sustain the public careers of mature women. But they presented different and indeed incompatible models of women's leadership. Tubman's redistributive politics did not appeal to most of the prominent liberals gathered for Anthony's birthday. And Anthony's focus on women's suffrage without mention of race or class seemed misguided to those organizing Tubman's fair. Both women would become even more prominent as they aged, as they aged. And that's the story I want to turn to now. So in the late 19th century, public birthdays grew in popularity, but they became rituals to honor the achievements of old people in their 70s and 80s. After the Civil War, all Americans, not just women suffragists, paid more attention to chronological age in general and old age as a stage of life in particular. So by the 1890s, the US Pension Bureau began using chronological age as a proxy for disability. Private companies experimented with the first age-based retirement programs. And doctors specialized in what would come to be known as gerontology. Age also mattered for young people as schools instituted age-graded classrooms and states passed the first age-based child labor laws. Historians explain these changes as part of a broader effort to bring scientific tools of management to bear on an industrializing democracy and a diverse citizenry. Printers, caterers, and merchants also commercialized birthdays. Prosperous Americans celebrated children's birthdays before the Civil War, inspired largely by Queen Victoria, it appears. By the 1850s, publishers and political parties held some birthday celebrations for prominent men. Then in the 1880s, printers marketed the first commercially produced birthday cards. Most women still didn't want to announce their exact age, but congratulating each other on the day of their birthday became more common among friends and family. Members of the National Women Suffrage Association continued to innovate ways of publicly honoring older women leaders on their birthdays. In 1885, they not only hosted a lavish party for Elizabeth Cady Stanton in New York City, but also sent out directions for how local suffrage clubs could hold parallel events all over the country. And they then documented this in a souvenir program. This was the occasion at which Stanton read her often quoted essay on the pleasures of age, in which she declared that 50, not 15, is the heyday a woman's life. Other suffragists, meanwhile, resisted the idea of public birthdays. So Lucy Stone, for example, was shocked in 1888 when people sent her gifts and telegrams congratulating her on 70 years, as she had, quote, no idea the day was known except by relatives and a few near friends. This convention program for 1893 presents middle-aged and older white women as the public face of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Lucretia Mott, on the left, died in 1880. She appears here as the foremother of Stanton, Stone, and Anthony. The speakers listed below include younger white women born between the 1840s and 1860s. They have a voice but they aren't elevated yet into this pantheon of great leaders. And the implication is they're going to have to wait for that. Uh, black women do not appear at all here. 
despite the fact that the women pictured were all part of the antebellum anti-slavery movement and all collaborated throughout their lives with black leaders. So what I want to emphasize is that this segregation of women suffrage leadership by race and age was not natural or inevitable or even really accurate, but it was artificial, constructed, and a misrepresentation, to be sure one that was done for political purposes to empower older white women. So a more accurate image would include younger women and non-white women as prominent leaders. It would emphasize Mott's connection to black women, including Harriet Tubman. In the 1880s and 1890s, Tubman campaigned for women's suffrage and fundraised to establish a home for elderly African Americans on her property in Auburn, New York. She moved among suffragists, black women's reform organizations, and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, always linking the vote to economic justice for African Americans. Interestingly, evidence suggests that some white suffragists sought to find some kind of day that could function for Tubman the way a birthday did for white women. So in 1894, Edna Dow Cheney sent funds to Tubman describing the contributions as, quote, a gift to herself, a birthday gift to herself. Um, in 1901, the Woman's Journal printed an appeal asking for contributions by December so these could be bundled and presented to Tubman as a Christmas gift. So you can see them trying to present these dates as, you know, give now. Um, but the largest boost to Tubman's reputation came from black women who invited her to attend the founding meeting of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1896. The black feminist theorist Brittany Cooper points out that this organization sought to counter the, quote, civic unknowability of black women. What I want to add here is that celebrating Tubman enabled them to emphasize black women as national leaders. So in the woman's air, under a reprint of Tubman's Civil War portrait, Victoria Earl Matthews wrote, the fact that we know so little that is credible and truly noble about our own people constitutes one of the saddest and most humiliating phases of Afro-American life. Matthews rallied black women to come to the convention and meet Tubman in person. In a grand spectacle of intergenerational solidarity, Tubman took the stage at the convention holding an infant, the son of anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells Barnett. As she stood there, the hall overflowed with emotion. As Matthews reported, the scene was impressive and thrilling. It was as the clasping of hands of the early 19th and 20th centuries. Anthony's 80th birthday in 1900 functioned in a similar way. The highlight of the evening came when 80 children marched across the stage, each handing her a rose. Now, as far as I can tell from press reports in this memorial portrait, all of the children were white. But Anthony did invite African-American suffragists to speak at her public birthdays. And this, I just want to underline, was really striking at a moment in American history when almost all public celebrations, even Lincoln's birthday celebrations, were racially segregated. So she is bringing black women into the movement. Uh, at Anthony's 80th, for example, um, Franklin, I'm sorry, Coralie Franklin Cook, spoke, and she praised Anthony as, quote, the courageous defender of rights wherever assailed. Anthony, in turn, made a great show of affection towards Cook, but this did not translate into coalition building. A year earlier, Anthony blocked a resolution that would have condemned Jim Crow segregation on the railroads. So Anthony's birthday celebrations function to include black women in the suffrage movement while simultaneously pushing their leadership and their political priorities to the margins. Anthony's 80th birthday staged a grand spectacle of generational succession in which she represented the past, middle-aged women took power in the present, and white children represented the future. This, I think, is a very early presentation of an idea that we've come to know as feminist waves. So in the 1960s, feminists coined the term second wave to both connect themselves with and distance themselves from 
this historical period. Then in the 1980s, we got younger women saying they were a third wave. We're now on to a fourth, fifth, maybe sixth wave, depending who you talk to. Historians and activists generally agree that it's time to let go of this metaphor, that it's divisive, that it's inaccurate. But we remain very trapped inside it. And I think it's in this moment, surprisingly in celebrations for older women, not the rebellion of youth, but in these celebrations for old women, that we see this idea taking form. OK, so after Anthony's event in 1900, many prominent women had 80th birthday galas, and not all were suffragists. So in 1902, when Elizabeth Carey Agassiz, the first president of Radcliffe, heard that supporters wanted to hold a concert for her 80th birthday, she wrote in her diary, quote, it is a lovely plan, but I have sworn that I would never have one of these semi-public birthdays. I must yield, not without dread. Her dread turned to delight when on the morning of her birthday, she received a surprising gift. Does anybody know what Agassiz's birthday gift was? Agassiz House. Elizabeth Carey Agassiz on her 80th birthday, received $116,000 to build Agassiz House. That is the equivalent of almost, actually, more than $3 million today. Quite a birthday present. Um, her son later wrote that Agassiz would, quote, like a second festival, provided it could be as lucrative as the first. Um, so you can see that these public birthdays are functioning very effectively to channel resources towards women's institutions and women's causes, to publicize the achievements of older women, and to inspire young women. And this is all an achievement, and it's all really effective in a lot of ways. The amount of money raised, of course, varies. The same year that Agassiz received a $116,000 birthday gift, Tubman supporters struggled mightily to raise $1,700 as a Christmas gift that would pay off the mortgage on her old people's homes. So in many ways, these celebrations didn't alleviate but exacerbated existing inequalities. OK, what about political power? Did women's suffragists succeed in convincing Americans outside their movement to take older women seriously as national leaders, to view them as potential congressmen and senators and presidents? Boiler alert, not so much. Um, so as Kristen Hoganson points out in her study of the Spanish-American War, expansionists labeled anti-imperialist aunties to render their leadership illegitimate and absurd. So cartoonists targeted old white women in particular as a threat to male potency. Here, prominent anti-imperialists are dressed as busy old women pulling down a statue representing the administration, the army, and the navy. Older African-American women had to contend with a different stereotype, aunt as loyal servant more dedicated to her enslaver's family than her own. This bogus idea took off in the 1890s when the R.T. Davis Mill Company began to market Aunt Jemima pancake mix, one of the first branded and widely advertised foodstuffs. The publicity campaign dubbed this invented character, quote, the most famous colored woman in the world and made up a biography for her, the fake life of an older black woman. An illustration claimed to be a truthful representation of Aunt Jemima feeding Confederates after the gunboats destroyed the master's plantation. Now, whether consciously or not, this precisely and insidiously erases Tubman's actual leadership navigating gunboats during the Civil War. And I think we have to read these images as a direct backlash against efforts to empower older women during this period. Now, if this was all that suffragists had to fight, these misogynistic and racist images in popular culture, that would have been difficult enough. But by the 1910s, they also had to contend with women suffrage leaders who began to market youth. So white suffragists focus more intensely. <laughs> I know, right? It's subtle. Um, so 
white suffragists focused on appealing to white male voters, and this is how they did it. They put prettier, conventionally attractive women out front as the face of the movement. This is actually my favorite, Beauty Brigade in Kansas, Canvas for Votes for Women. So these beauty brigades um, are part of this massive propaganda campaign mo that mobilized the techniques of modern advertising, public spectacle, and celebrity, all of which turned on circulating images of conventionally attractive, white, often quite wealthy women. None of these women are over 35. Old women remained active in the movement. They joined these massive suffrage parades, but they were put behind the beauties, set apart in motor cars, and treated as curiosities. Their birthdays continued to receive attention, but young women had become the face of the movement. Black women adopted this strategy too. The journalist Pauline Hopkins, editor of the Colored American Magazine here in Boston, wrote often about the leadership of mature black women, including this really important profile of Tubman. But the visual culture of the magazine as a whole centered on picturing young black women as glamorous, as modern, as beautiful. And I want to underline that this is really important, too. A lot of Americans felt that black women weren't beautiful. And claiming them as beautiful is political, is powerful, even for white suffragists who faced the charge that political activism would make them unattractive. This was important to say that suffragists could be beautiful and glamorous. But what drops out of this effort entirely is the connections between maturity and power that women were drawing in the late 19th century. So beauty sells, and it, suffragists took up advertising, and then advertisers appealed to suffragists. And this marketing accomplished what Anthony and her supporters had been unable to achieve, the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Now, we should not describe this as the winning of women's suffrage. It just removed sex as a barrier. State governments used literacy tests, poll taxes, and identity verification to disenfranchise many people. And in fact, the voter ID laws that are being passed in state after state today are a continuation of this strategy. So voting is not a secure right. It's a privilege that states can regulate. And voting is also very different than running for office or getting elected. So after 1920, American women did not effectively organize to elect women to national office, and progress in this vein has remained remarkably slow. Which brings us back to the construction of Susan B. Anthony as a great statement, equivalent to the most beloved presidents. So after 1920, members of the National Women's Party gather every year on February 15th in the crypt of the US Capitol, where was, there was this statue of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Susan B. Anthony. It's the closest suffragists have to a national monument. So they gather, they lay flowers, they give speeches. Black women continue to attend these events. So that's Mary Church Terrell, the first president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in the lovely fur collar. She talked about how Anthony was an abolitionist as well as a suffragist mm -hmm. trying to keep alive these connections. Um, Rose Arnold Powell, whose papers are at the Schlesinger, campaigned relentlessly to turn Anthony's birthday into a national holiday. That Anthony had been born in February was a happy accident she used to promote the idea of three great emancipators. So Washington freed his country, Lincoln freed the slaves, and Anthony freed women, or so the story went. Powell wrote every calendar company in the US year after year, urging them to list Anthony's birthday in February, <laughs> along with Washington's and Lincoln's. A few states, including Massachusetts, did turn Anthony's birthday into holidays. As far as I know, this is no longer a thing. It, it was briefly. We, Massachusetts had a holiday. But we still, in this country, have no national holiday that honors a woman as a leader. And what about Tubman? African American women named a number of social service organizations in her honor, including the Harriet Tubman House here in Boston, founded when Tubman was still alive and she was actually present at the dedication. 
This clipping from the Delta Sigma Theta papers at Schlesinger shows school children celebrating the 55th anniversary of the Tubman home in 1959. So even though Tubman didn't have a birthday, these institutions named after her could have anniversaries and rally people around her memory. Uh, under President Obama, the Treasury Department planned to put Tubman's face on the redesigned $20 bill. Trump's Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin has announced that this plan is on hold. In 1978, Tubman did become the first black woman to be put on a postage stamp, and Polly Murray, the civil rights lawyer and Episcopal priest, read a beautiful benediction at the day of issue ceremony. The point I want to make here is that we know about Anthony and Tubman because women worked to convince people that they were national leaders as worthy of recognition as white men. Now, most Americans never accepted the idea that these women were on a par with Washington or Lincoln, but that we remember them at all as an important legacy of black and white women's organizing. That white women like Pell downplayed the contributions of black women is also, of course, a legacy. But what I want to leave you with today, what I want to draw your attention to, is another facet of this memorialization. And that is how white women remembered Anthony's age. By the 1930s, Anthony's longevity was a curiosity. Ripley's Believe It or Not for February 15, 1938 read, Susan B. Anthony died at the age of 86. Her mother died at the age of 86. Her grandmother died at 86. Never changed the style of her hairdress in 70 years. <laughs> it's true, you can line up the photos. <laughs> um, soon, a much younger Anthony began to appear in popular culture. So this Wonder Woman comic is my favorite example of a particularly fresh-faced Anthony. Uh, in this comic, she does grow old, but her supporters all remain remarkably young. In 1939, a year after the Ripley's cartoon, Ethel Adamson of the National Woman's Party planted, the word she used, this picture in newspapers for February stories on Anthony's birthday. It shows Anthony at age 48. Adamson explained to Powell, quote, we all love Susan at every age, but a little youth does seem more attractive for a change. Powell agreed she thought school children would relate more to this image. And this is the image that stuck. So here's Anthony on her 126th birthday, looking younger than she did when she first celebrated her birthday in 1870. And she's still young in 1971 when the National Organization for Women joined the birthday celebration ritual, and again on the coin minted in 1979. By the 1970s, Anthony had undergone one of the greatest anti-aging treatments in American history. <laughs> the result is that we can remember her without engaging in the politics of age and power that her generation was so concerned with. So look again at this image that I started with. Anthony at age 80. She's posed against a black cloth that emphasizes her white hair in harsh light showing every wrinkle. This image was on a calendar that suffragists bought and hung in their homes. As they used the calendar, they may have planned their own time in new ways, looking forward to growing older themselves, certainly looking forward to the day when Americans would recognize a woman like Anthony as having demonstrated the political skill and experience to be elected president of the United States. To get to that point, to elect a woman president, we will need to innovate a new politics of women's midlife empowerment, one that somehow resists the tendency to divide women by age, race, and class, and instead finds ways to build political coalitions that work across these divides for shared purposes. And this won't be easy. We can't just hope that young women will do this work on their own. Middle-aged and older women need to work with them and for them in particular movements, and young women will need to partner with their elders. If we can understand that age itself has a history, a history deeply connected to gender, race, class, and power, 
we may be able to generate better strategies. At least that is my hope in talking to you today. Thank you so much for listening.